Welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Mitch Weisberg, and I'm, uh, you probably know me because I sent out all the annoying emails. Uh, I'm with EdChat Interactive, and today we're going to be talking, we're going to be having a fireside chat on creating effective, effective remote learning experiences uh, with John Finley. And John's coming to us through the Serious Play Conference. I just want to let you know that at the EdChat Interactive Dot org website we have actually two more sessions coming up in the next few weeks we have one on cross curricular lessons to unleash student creativity uh, Monica Joshi is coming it will be uh, joining us from India to present lessons that she's used in a bunch of schools in India and then in September or sorry sorry in October uh, we have how digital learning can use game like rewards to improve engagements and we're going to be adding more sessions over the next couple of weeks. So if you come to the website, the EdChat Interactive website, you'll see you'll see other sessions as well. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and we'll get uh, John up. And John, while you're getting your slides up, why don't you just d describe like how did you get to where you are now? And where did your interest in, you know, using making things more interested interesting for remote learning where did that come from well um for, well i i spent my whole life making games out of stuff when i was a kid um my dad is a frugal fella and we used to heat our house um, with actually a wood stove so every year we had to go and ch uh, cut down trees and then and then chop and so i i chopped wood in the fall while my friends were playing ball hockey and to make it more bearable i would um, if I were able to chop a log in one swipe, I'd put it in one pile. And if it was two, two, two swipes, I would put it in a second pile and three and so on. And then I would count them. So I kind of made a game out of chopping wood. So I've kind of made games out of things for most of my life. I first started doing it in the training space when I was a corporate trainer um, teaching management how to use SAP back in the <laughs> late 90s. Um, and so I was able to sort of turn the classroom training into a bit more of a game so people didn't hate me. Um, and then I started a business um, turning marketing programs into games, which is called Launchfire. It's still in existence. It's still a I'm still going concern. Um, and it is a game-based marketing uh, um, company. And the marketing programs we build are designed to educate consumers and drive sales. So our customers naturally would play these games and say, hey, these are great learning experience. Can we morph them into an e-learning program? So we started doing that back in 2005. The first time we did it was for the Tylenol brand. And after after that, we did everything we could to ignore that business, but despite our utter neglect and worse marketing efforts, we kept getting a trickle of clients. So um, about four years ago, we staffed up and built Lemonade LXP, which is a game-based learning experience platform. Um, it's our, our, our mandate, our mission is kind of to, to make training fun and more effective, to sort of inject a bit of empathy into learning. And one of the things that I noticed as in our talks, because we've talked a few times leading up to this, is that the things that you're doing with making learning more fun, they apply to corporate, to, they, to lifelong learning, to university and college learning, to secondary school and also to primary school. It's basically things that interest all of us in online learning, no matter how old or, or young we are, right? Yeah, I mean, look, I think um, in terms of taking the game-based approach, everybody plays games, you know, whether it's board games or video games or sports or um, um, I think everybody enjoys them. You see the witness, the popularity of game shows and so on and so forth. And I think it's just about making it fun um, for people to engage with content. Um, and I think that spans across generations and demographics and ethnicities. Uh, it's it's kind of universal. Yeah. So I know, you know, we were talking basic about the types of things that you're going to be covering. Um, and I, I, you know, I know we talked about agenda. Do you have that in your slides or should we just verbally go through those? Yeah, we can just go through them. I mean, I think the first thing um, in sort of trying to create effective an effective learning experiences is understanding that um, with more people, working or, or in school remotely, there are a lot of new distractions um, that people are facing that they weren't facing pre-pandemic. Uh, you know, from a work 
perspective, you know, people, it might be um, kids and pets and so forth. Um, and, and from a school perspective, you know, you're competing against uh, video games, friends, FaceTime, uh, you name it. And I think that we need to be mindful of that um, and understand that in order to engage the at-home learner, I really think we need to raise the bar a little bit in terms of engagement. Um, and if we do it well enough, they will participate voluntarily as opposed to being forced. And so I think that's really the first key point um, that, that we're focusing on is how do we make the training experience sufficiently compelling that we can compete with the myriad of distractions that people face at home. Yeah, I just find from home, there's just so many things that um, whether I'm working or I'm learning, that just crop up. <laughs> and unless I'm really engaged, it's so easy to just say, well, you know something, I'm going to catch up with this later or I'm just going to forget it. Well, and I think the other thing that's happening is that people's um, work or school life and their personal life are becoming much more blurred. The lines are blurred. Um, I, I watch my kids. Um, they're, my, my daughter is 14, my son is 12, and they have been doing the remote um, um, learning stuff. And I watch how blended their life is. Like they, you know, they'll do a little bit of schoolwork and then uh, a friend FaceTimes them and they do something else. Or my daughter who's a musician goes and plays her piano and then comes back. Um, so I think there's a certain amount of flexibility um, that you're seeing in people's days. Um, and those distractions are there. It doesn't mean they're not gonna do the work. It just means that they're gonna do it in a different way now, I think. Yeah. And so the next thing that I, I, I wanted to highlight was, um, you know, I, in, in the corporate space, um, a lot of companies are using their learning management system, sort of traditional learning management. And that's the case sometimes in, the, um, in, in education as well. And I, I think that we, we need to do a little better than that. I think a lot of traditional LMS training is very static. Um, and it's, it's, it's very much um, a learner reads or watches a video um, watch it, checks out some slides, um, but there's not a lot of interactivity. Um, and what we see in the corporate space, which is where the majority of our clients are, is that there is a significant amount of employee apathy towards the learning management system. And then coupled with some technological issues of like, you know, a lot of learning management systems are on-premises. So people to access them have different challenges. So I, I think we need to modernize that experience um, and it's going to take a much more learner focused approach. I think that the, the best ways to effectively educate people are when they are um, uh, receptive to it. And in order to do that, we've got to make our, our, our educational content as compelling as possible. So I think that's a bit of a, of a challenge overcoming some of the old technology. And I, I think as, as you bring that up, it looks like these two, points that you brought up really are tandem because given the fact that people are or the kids or the, the learners um, are at home and have more distractions then when learning is compulsory they're that much less likely to do it if they were in a classroom whether a corporate classroom higher ed k-12 whatever and there's a teacher or instructor in front of the classroom the instructor can enforce compliance and it can enforce people to pay a certain amount of attention. But when the instructor isn't in, isn't in front of them, then we have to think much more about the learning experience. That's what I'm gathering from what you said, is that we have to pay much more attention to the learning experience and get the learner voluntarily engaged in what they're learning or about to learn. Is that a decent summary? Yeah, and I think a really crucial thing, word that you use there is enforce. And I think if, if the learning experience requires enforcement, we're already failing. Because I think people learn when, they, when they're when they um, engaged and, and receptive. But I think if, if it, they need to be forced, um, there's only a certain amount of success we can, ex we can expect in a situation like that. Mm -hmm. So that speaks to, you know, ratcheting up the engagement, I think. 
Anna, I'm interested to know, and you can, you know, you, you can put this in the chat or you can volunteer to come up is, uh, you know, your own experiences or your experiences with the people you're teaching when they're online, when they feel that they have to do something versus when they're engaged or when it's, it's, uh, they have um, a certain amount of choice. You know, what, what are you, you all finding also? But good, thanks. So the other thing that I'm um, a sort of a cornerstone of how we have approached our, our business um, and, and particularly the development of our learning platform is very much uh, um, trying to trying to remember to be empathetic. Um, and I think there's a lot of stuff we need to understand about our learners. Um, in particular right now, people are going through a lot of different things that are unusual. Um, there's some social isolation. There's um, certain emotional roller coaster that comes along with um, this pandemic and, and some of the, the restrictions being imposed on people. And so trying to understand the challenges that your learners face, um, you know, it could be anything from technology um, to internet access to um, distractions in the home. Um, and then going then getting into even more how they like to learn. Um, we all learn differently. Um, and, and I think the more we can listen, the more we can solicit feedback from our learners to understand how we can adapt our programs to, to best suit the various different circumstances that people are going through. And I recognize you can't please all the people all the time. Um, but, but I think listening is very important in trying to get feedback and understand the circumstance of the learner and having a real empathetic approach is going to lead to uh, a much greater success. I think even just in the sense of learners feeling like, like their, their, their opinion and their circumstance matters goes a long way. So what do you mean by listening to the learners? What do you, and, and being empathetic, could you, um, could you go into that in a little bit more depth? Absolutely. So um, I, th I think, so for example, if you were to just use um, um, video to teach people, there's no feedback coming from folks in that circumstance. So I think there's a lot of different ways we can solicit feedback. Um, if our learning platform has um, the ability to, to enter comments or a chat functionality um, also, or, or if you need to solicit feedback via various other channels, depending on the age of your learners. Um, kids might not be so great to email, but uh, you know, if you, can, if you can instant message them some way or uh, connect with them on, on platforms that they're using to solicit feedback. Um, but I think the best solution is to have some type of communication mechanism baked into whatever platform you're using. Um, but I think it's through there that we can get real feedback and also listening to comments that aren't necessarily directed at you, but rather just people making comments about the learning experience. Because I think people are fundamentally reluctant to tell the, the teacher or the trainer that, you know, we didn't enjoy your training. Nobody likes to say that, they feel rude. Uh, but they might put it in a comment and go, boy, this was boring. And it's about going and reading those things and seeing, you know, it, are there things we can glean about um, what the learners are going through and how they're um, digesting our content and our experience to make to and allow us to sort of change it and morph it and make it a little better. I think just there are two comments related to this. I think you know Zoe Camper was saying that um, make understanding the learner and making sure that the material is really relevant to them and understand why why they're learning that. That that's that's an important aspect. That was the first one, but you, maybe you can comment on that. Yeah, well, I mean, yeah. I, I take my kids, for example, my daughter is a very enthusiastic learner, never needs to be prompted to do her homework. Whereas my son, well, that's a whole other story. Um, and, and, you know, I'll give you an example that isn't school related. What, when I was teaching my son to skate, I'm a Canadian guy, so we play hockey, that's what we do. Um, I was teaching him to skate and he had no appetite for it whatsoever. And he would just sit in the middle of the ice crying. And one day it just dawned on me. I took off my hat and said, bet you can't get my hat. Well, he shot to his feet, lunged towards me, fell flat on his face, but he didn't care because now his goal was to get the hat 
not to try to do something that he perceived himself as failing at. And there was an insight there. You know, he was learning without knowing he was learning. And by the end of a half hour skating session, he could skate. <laughs> and it, when we were driving home, I said, you know, you should be pretty proud of yourself. You can skate now. And he hadn't even really thought of it. I mean, he was only two and a half or three years old, but he hadn't really thought of it. And, you know, for me, that was a, that was a, a bit of an epiphany, you know, and, and I think that's what ad adapting a learning experience to meet the individual learner, if you can, I recognize that when you're trying to educate a broad swath of people, it's hard to customize for everybody. Mm -hmm. But the more we listen, the better we can customize and make it as good as that can, it can be for as big a group of people as possible. And, and just related, Brenda Fisk, uh, Frisk asked even before Zoe had her comment, you know, how do you really know that your learners are engaged and, and learning? Do you use learning al analytics? Are there algorithms? Are there, what other, and are there other ways when the students are um, remote? or they're learning online? Well, I can speak to our platform. Um, our platform has an analytics package that um, measures a bunch of different things. So first of all, uh, on it, from a sort of 30,000 foot view level, it'll, it'll measure um, interactions um, but from each learner throughout uh, a, any given period. So, you know, how many, how many questions they've answered, how many modules they've interacted with, how much time they've spent in the learning portal, and you can report on, on a daily basis. But you can also then, because Lemonade's game-based, um, it, it prompts people to try again when they haven't gotten that great a score. And so what Lemonade does is it tracks the first few times a, a learner takes each module, and then as they continue to play to better their score, it tracks their average. And then it pits their average against their initial score, their baseline, to measure how much, how, how much mastery they have of, of, the cor of that particular courseware. We can also then um, measure the courseware itself, the training material. So you can go and, sp and, and, and grab a specific course and say, how many learners have participated? Um, how much has their knowledge increased? Um, and then you can drill down into the specific challenges they've been issued and see which ones they're accelerating at and which ones they're not doing very well at. So you can identify knowledge gaps. So I think the reporting is very much two-pronged. Reporting on learner activity and, and learner improvement, but then also reporting on the performance of your content, which I think is a bit of a rare thing. But I think it's really important because if you start to see that there's content that learners aren't engaged with or that they're doing very poorly at you can say you can infer some things you can say well if they're not engaged then we're not promoting it right or they just simply are avoiding it because they don't like the subject matter or and then if they're not doing well is the content too hard did we need to have a uh, a 101 version to level people up to the to the to the area that we want or um or is it simply that we need some a different a different type of module to train them on the specific content so i think measuring the learner performance and the content performance is really crucial and it gives you a, a much deeper bit of feedback on how your uh, your programs are performing and and as a the person who's leading a session or who's developing the material i think you know i'm looking at uh dennis travers comment i hope i'm pronouncing your name right um, that if the sub, you know, making, thinking through, and that's your empathy part, uh, John, is, is uh, thinking through, is the content rele relevant to the people who are learning um, or what would make the content relevant and thinking through how do I get them to buy in to learn? And maybe you get them to buy in by having some type of a goal like getting your hat <laughs> or some other goal. Um, or maybe uh, you're getting their buy-in from, from other means because maybe it's a fun game that they're playing. Yeah, for us, uh, the, um, so. Oh, and it's Denise, I'm sorry, sorry. I, I, Denise, I'm so sorry, thank you. Go ahead. <laughs> that, that's funny. Um, yeah, Lemonade has a sort of a unique approach in that it has a central narrative game um, that is like SimCity. And, but its real goal is just to get you to come back every day. Um, 
And but how you perform in the actual training influences your progress in the narrative game. So the, the narrative game is really designed just to keep people coming back each day to see how many points because you once you um, progress to a certain level, you start to earn points while you're not training. So people want to come back each day to see how many points they have, and then they can use it to level up. Um, but the real way that they progress fastest is to take the training and excel at it. So when they don't do well in a training module, they actually regress in the narrative game or the booster game, as we call it. Um, so when they, so then they're, they're influenced to go and try that training module again to improve their score so that they progress faster in, in the booster game. So for us, we use a real game-based approach because we found that it, for, it's been very effective for us over the years. So. Good. Okay. Well, let's proceed. Cause I, I think okay. um, people, I, I'm um, probably interested in kind of a, a roll up your sleeves and how do you go about doing it? So. Sure. Well, I wanted to talk a little bit about flexibility too. Um, I, I mentioned the blurring of, of people's days and, and their personal lives and, and work or learning lives. Um, I think flexibility is crucial. I think you need to, your content needs to be available to folks all the time um, and they can take it when they want, how they want. Um, and I think that um, it should also be um, uh, accessible on as many devices as possible. Um, you know, some learners will be on an old uh, laptop or, or PC. Others might be um, want to engage on, on, a, on a mobile device. Um, I know that uh, as I've watched my kids, um, they tend to gravitate towards um, the hand-me-down phones that they have. Um, more so than um, laptops and so on and so forth. So I think flexibility is a really crucial element um, to make your training as as uh, accessible as possible. Now, relating to flexibility in a lot of the K-12 schools, I know the scheduling has become pretty rigid. So that may work in classes. How do you, if you're kind of stuck on these time frames? Are there ways that you can be more flexible, you know, that you can think of to be more flexible? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I'm kind of a believer that, I mean, kind of this ties into my next thought uh, um, is that um, I, I think that we have to be careful with the use of video conferencing. Um, and the reason that I say that is um, I, I think that it's a very passive way of teaching and I'm not so sure that it's the best way to teach. So I think if a lot of the learning experience is about jumping on videos and so for video conferencing, I think that's got a role, but I think being able to assign, um, if you can call it homework or, or in class work at home in class work, um, there's where we can be flexible and we can say, you know, we're going to assign this, but you don't have to do it right now, but you have to have it done for tomorrow. Um, that gives the learner a little bit of autonomy um, and allows them some flexibility in their day and how they want to approach it. I'm sure you're going to have some people who take advantage of that flexibility and don't get the work done. Um, but they, you know, those are, you'll probably have the same problem with them being distracted. But I think the other thing about video conferencing that I worry about is um, people multitask when they're watching a video. I mean, nowadays, you know, if you watch your kids. Nobody here, TV, every, everybody here, by the way, is glued to their screens. There isn't a single person who's watching here who's multitasking, I'll bet. But Mitch, that really speaks to how compelling you are as a, as a, as a host, I think. But, <laughs> but, it, but like if you watch your kids watching TV, how many of them are just sitting there watching TV? No, they are on their phones, they're on their uh, game machines and whatever. So that's the caution I have is that it's very easy to get distracted and multitasking when using the video conferencing. So when you talk about flexibility and rigid scheduling, um, you know, some of that is going to be video conferencing. And I think that's got a role, but really more a role of like answering questions, um, doling out some assignments and hopefully they're fun assignments um, and, and being supportive um, and, and, and handling, providing feedback and handling questions, I think is really how that should be used more so than, lecturing per se. That's my opinion. So I'm looking at this, this statement that you, you have up now. Um, and I'm, by the way, I, I also want to say if people have ideas about how you make learning, especially re learning remotely, more flexible things like 
uh, well, John, you brought up recording your videos in advance. Um, please put them into the chat and uh, we could, and if you want to talk about any of them, just mention in the chat if you'd like to come up and we can bring you up also to, uh, to talk about some of your ideas. I'm looking at the phrase here and um, I'm thinking, you know, a lot of people don't read enough. So what did you mean by, uh, what was the purpose in putting the Albert Einstein quote here? Um, so I couldn't find the perfect quote for the, uh, the, a man or a person who watches too much is really what I was looking for. But um, it captures the essence of what, uh, of what I think is the limitation of, of straight video conferences, that you're in a receptive and passive mode uh, listening, to just the same way when I was a kid in school and teachers would get up in front of the class and talk for a long time. Um, you your mind gets lazy um, and you and because it's not interactive and it's not challenging you. Um, and so I think that the best training is going to, or learning is going to encourage you, is going to challenge you and incur and solicit input from you. Um, and so I think that video and stuff like that is a little bit passive. I think it has a role. I just don't, I, I, I would say this, I think it's a spice and not a staple. And we were talking, I think you also brought up that uh, to a large extent, you know, learning, be, learning is social or there's a, there's a tremendous social aspect of learning. So how do you bring that into remote learning? Yeah, so I think, um, I love this quote, by the way, Tupac Shakur, that's a great quote. Um, I think social is so, so crucial. Um, you can learn more as a group uh, than you can as an individual. And when, you know, when peop new people come to our company, for example, um, the amount of learning they do just in talking to colleagues uh, throughout the day. And, and we, we use the Lemonade platform to train new people and, and that works really well as well. But there's a lot of it that's, that's talking. Um, and so I think the social aspect, um, you know, if you're going to use Zoom, for example, making it so that everybody can talk, there's sort of really 101. But I think also um, the ability for to have, um, you know, one on one sessions, uh, group sessions, assigning um, uh, projects to, to groups, that sort of thing. And then where the technology is concerned, enabling the technology, it's about, again, going back to um, comments, chats, these types of things where, um, and even the ability to, um, you know, follow um, a fellow student, um, kind of like you would on a social network to see what they're doing and how they're performing. Um, these types of things make it the experience more social. And I think right now, that's the one thing people are missing um, a little bit is the social aspect. And so certainly my kids, I, I, I hear it from them, you know, they, they miss being able to hang out with their friends as frequently. Yeah. Um, and so they're using technology to bridge that gap. And so I think we in the learning industry should use technology to bridge that gap as well. You know, just when you say uh, kids missing their friends, the, you know, just, it just reminded me of two things. One is the number one issue that kids brought up around the world with remote learning is the, is not being able to be with their friends. What do you think the number one advantage they pointed out, kids pointed out around the world to using remote learning? Gosh, I don't know. They could sleep later. They could sleep that later. Was yeah, that was by far number one. Um, and it didn't matter what the country was, you know, with Europe, uh, Asia, South America, that was a number one advantage from kids around the world that they, that they loved what, about remote. You know what's so interesting about that? Um, first of all, um, if there's tons of, of research out there that shows that if you're underslept, you can't learn as efficiently. Um, and it goes back to that whole discussion or part of the section discussion about flexibility. Um, you know, why should we worry about when someone acquires the knowledge as opposed to whether they acquired it effectively? You know, they, it, it, so to me, it's a prioritization thing, but then the other thing that I find interesting about it is um, it speaks to that um, desire 
to have a little bit more control over their day and their life. And what kid, what, what person didn't feel that as a kid, feeling right. the desire to have a little more control? So going back to the empathy point, if you think about what a younger person is going through as they grow up, and especially as they go from, you know, so, um, uh, um, or, or, um, primary school, um, where they're accustomed to having their life governed by their parents, but now they're going into middle school, they're getting a little more freedom, or high school, and they're getting tons of freedom, yet still the school is saying, we're going to control your day. Right. Well, that's, a, that's a pain point for a kid. So why can't we? Why can't we change that? Uh, maybe because we're stuck in an old mindset, but we could. This is interesting because there's been two or three comments uh, West Van from West Vancouver and from Michael Graydon about, you know, the advantage of asynchronous contact. And you brought that up also that instead of having a live lecture, if you're going to be lecturing anyhow, why not record it and let the kids watch it and use your live sessions as more social. Um, and then, you know, Zoe uh, Camper was bringing up the fact that, you know, maybe in remote learning, we could make things more mobile. Um, and then um, there was a question about, um, about Lemonade. Um, trying to, oh, does it, does it allow, you know, do you allow um, users to develop and load their own content? My guess is you do, right? Yes. So Lemonade has all authoring tools baked in and you can author anything from game-based learning to um, simulations or walkthroughs of technology to um, uh, mentoring remote instructor led. You can do all sorts of things in Lemonade. So yeah, you can author um, your own content and you know, you could open up authoring up to as many people as you wanted within your organization. And you know, that's an interesting element. Imagine if you enabled students to create their own games for other students, how fun would that be? Right, right. You it's know, funny. And, and, oh, go ahead. And I'll, I'll, sorry, I'll just, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I'll tell you because when we, when we launched the platform, we, we wanted to author a bunch of content into it. And you'd be surprised how much you learn authoring content because you got to go research. It's like, oh, I'm going to make a, I'm going to make a, a cool game about this content. You've got to go research the content and you learn through, through doing so. Um, a great way. That's a that's an awesome way to teach. And letting the kids, yeah, the, letting the kids write the content. And I think so. Michael Graydon um, pointed out when I said that, that that the number one thing that the kids wanted was more sleep, and he pointed out that which was really I think related to your point also that it isn't just the fact that they can sleep late; it's that they can control their own schedule. You know, it's there's it such a difference. I mean, if we think of things that we do in our lives, if there's something that you have to do, like, let's say, take out the garbage, okay? If you think, like, I have to take out the garbage, it becomes, I mean, how hard are you going to work at taking out the garbage? You're going to, you know, you're not going to spend a lot of time on it. But when you can change from, in, if you can change somebody's mind from, I have to, to, I get to, then all of a sudden it becomes something that they want and they're willing to put more effort into it. And I think that's Michael and your point as well, right? Yeah, I think I think in order to go from have to to get to, the experience has to become less of a chore, right? And more fun. Mm -hmm. that, and then, and to me, that's the premise of it. Um, when you know, I'll give you another example. My same, my son. You guys are going to think he's terrible. <laughs> he was a very enthusiastic Lego builder. Um, but he was not nearly as enthusiastic about cleaning up after his session. <laughs> so I would take the Lego box, put it in the middle of the room and say, how many pieces can you throw in in a row? And more than once, he emptied it out a second time, only to clean up again to play. And so it's it's just about that. It's about how can we make, if it, you know, if, okay, the cleaning up is a chore, but how can we make go from have to to get to? And I think it's about making it, finding ways to make it fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so, so let's, so how do you make it fun? Well, um, for us, it's, we morph the experience into a game and that works for a good chunk of people. And I won't say that it works for everyone because there are certain people who don't want to learn that way. But when we compare it to other learning programs that were sort of compared to in the corporate world, uh, it's, it's a it's a pretty big mismatch um the the game-based approach i mean at 
we have had more than half of our clients have actually had to put limits on the amount of time people spend training each day. Um, now we haven't done as much in the, in the education space, although the university of Oregon is using lemonade right now to do, to run a training for a learning program for, I think it's for teachers. Um, but at any rate, I think it's really about, um, again, going back to the empathy and going back to making the experience fun. And that is issuing challenges, providing feedback, um, and then tacking on those sort of gamification layers. So there's a big difference between gamification and game-based learning. Gamification is would be tacking game elements onto your existing content. So, you know, watch a video, get a badge, uh, read a PDF, get a badge, see how many badges you have on the leaderboard. Um, Game-based learning is when you morph the learning experience into a game so that people learn through play. And then you can tack those leaderboards and all that stuff on. But if you don't change the learning experience, then you and you just tack game elements on, it's gamification. But when you change the experience, it's game-based learning. And that has much, much more solid legs than gamification. So I think that's kind of our secret sauce anyway. So how would you, so let's say, let's take an example, because in almost in all grades, there are times where you want people to be researching something, uh, finding out information from whatever sources they can. How do you turn that into, what's an example of turning that into a game? Yeah, so um, curating content, I think, is a really crucial element. I mean, I, it's funny. My mom and my wife isn't as, as super into tech, but my my parents and my wife will ask me things. My kids will Google. They don't ask me much. And if they want something, it's funny. It's funny because my wife will tell me things. <laughs> but you know, I mean, I'm, just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I should say. Yeah, yeah, I hear you. But like when, when, when my mom asked me something that I don't know, I'll always say, did you Google it? Whereas my kids will Google it first and they don't get an answer. They like, they're going to, they're going to come to me. And so curating content, I think is, is really crucial. And it also teaches kids when we were kids, we had, to, we had to go to, um, to the library and learn how to use the Dewey decimal system and microfiche right. and all that. I know I'm dating myself. I know, but our curating content starts to teach kids how to, how to go out and, and leverage all the great stuff on the internet. Not necessarily that they need to know that a lot of them already know it, but to continue to build that habit by taking content that um, you, is relevant and linking out to it and having them interact with it, I think makes a ton of sense. We have uh, content curating uh, stuff for both just web pages and for YouTube and Lemonade, and it gets used an awful lot. We use it for our own internal training and our clients use it all the time. So I think it's crucial. And there's just, it also takes a bit of weight off content creation too, which is nice. So I guess one, you know, you might have set up like a contest for whoever finds the best resource or whoever finds the most resources around something it would be yeah. ways of gamifying it. You could do that. Um, what we tend to do is so because you have all these sort of various different authoring tools within, within Lemonade. Um, one of the ways that our clients use it all the time is to just to link out to a piece of content or video and then have a follow-up game about it. So you, you kind of digest the content and then you play a game to sort of test how much you retained. That's one way of doing it. Um, and the other thing you can do is tie that into the social element and ask learners when they find a great piece of content, post it for people. Um, and yeah, you can certainly, you can certainly track how many, how many pieces, how much content each, each learner has curated for you and, and have some type of contest for sure. Um, and I'm looking at this next quote. So wisdom is learning what to overlook. Um, there's so many different ways to take that. What did you, uh, what was your purpose in putting that quote in? Well, in going back to Google, there's an awful lot of stuff on there. Um, and, but I think, and I think you need to pick wisely. So in curating content, I think part of how, how not to make that lame is to make sure that you're picky about what you curate um, and what you link out to um, because there's an awful lot of overlookable information on the internet. Um, but there's a lot of great stuff there too. So I think that's where I was going with that one. Going back to the previous point where we were talking about um, 
I guess, games to solidify content. I think Doug, Douglas Green has a good point that recall solidifies learning or solidifies knowledge. And so self-testing is really, um, that's a great tool to use. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Um, there's two ways to approach that. One is read content, play game. The other is just play the game. And the reason that's effective is, as I mentioned, there's a booster game. And if you do poorly in the learning game, you don't use your progress is inhibited in the booster game. So what you see is people will play the learning game multiple times to maximize their score, to maximize their pro progress in the booster game. And through that repetition, they learn. So it's, you don't necessarily have to have the content first and the game next if the game has triggers to drive repeat play. Because repetition is a big thing. I don't know how many people watched uh, the Michael Jordan documentary, The Last Dance. But what struck me about that was how before every practice and after every practice, there he was shooting baskets. Everybody else had gone to the locker room. And that's just repetition. It's just straight doing stuff. I'm a musician. And I can tell you, you, you can't learn it all in a three hour session. It's got to be bite sized and it's got to be constant and you got to do it over and over and over again. So that's not the only way to learn, but it certainly works. Right. Well, and uh, we used to, I guess around 20 years ago, I was talking to people and there's testing to test what you learn, but, but testing is a form of learning also. Yeah. So yeah. testing as learning. Um, yeah, you know, as I'm get, I'm looking at, at the quote, and I'm also looking at uh, Michael Graydon's comment. You know, it's um, what we're not, you're not saying is uh, just use confirmation bias, right? Uh, only look for the things that agree with you. That it's the wisdom is really learning what's extraneous and what you need in order to get better, right? Yeah, and I think there's another thing you don't learn much from people or content that agrees with your perspective. And so I think there's something to be said for um, searching out stuff and leveraging stuff that presents the other side of the coin from whatever thing that you're trying to teach. Because part of, I think part of, of learning is being able to, um, to, look at two different answers to a problem and decide which one you think is sort of um, better jives with who you are and how you want to interpret. Because, in you know, unless you're talking about math and, and science, there aren't a lot of absolutes. You know, if it's, you want to, you want to talk about how uh, a novel that you read and, you know, you can say, oh, there's all these literary themes and so on and so forth, but it is art after all. And what I get out of it is what I get out of it. So I, I think, there's something to be said for looking for content that is can be a little bit contrarian to your existing point of view, just to broaden someone's brain a little bit. And as a person who's designing a learning experience, how do you help the learners focus on the um, on the things that they should be focusing on? Well, um, you know, that's a lot of that's done through how you. How, you know, for, first of all, the, the software has the ability to create learning paths, so you can you can trigger specific um, content when they reach certain thresholds. You know, if, if they complete level one of something, or if they a new learner is added, or whatever, you can trigger specific content. So that's one way. Another way is in how you arrange the content within the content library. So you know, there's always a featured course, and you can and the featured course, of course, gets the most clicks. Um, the interface is very, very, very much like Netflix. So, you know, it's how you promote stuff and where you place it on the page and so on and so forth. That's, I'm looking at Douglas Green's uh, comment about New York Times versus New York Post. And if you're in the New York area, there's a, there's like, I mean, there's always a feud between the two publications, but it's really interesting now that there was a post, there's a um, op-ed type post in the New York Post about how New York City is going to decline, period. And then the New York Times had a post that like jumped on top of that, that said, this person doesn't have grit. And then the New York Post had the, you know, their their editorial coming back and saying, no, no, you, you can say that because you're actually in the Hamptons as you're writing that um, <laughs> with your five cars. 
Um, if you know, if you were in the middle of New York and you saw what was really going on, uh, you would understand that New York is not New York anymore. And it's kind of going. It's just interesting how, you know, if you were just a New York Times reader, you would see one side, and if you were just a New York Post reader, you would see the other side. But going back and forth between the two opposing viewpoints, you can really um, see you get a more complete view of what's going on. Yeah, and in, and in an increasingly polarized world, if we can do anything to get people to see more than one perspective, I think it's helpful for not just the person, but the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so moving along, I mean, the next point, I'm kind of flogging a dead horse here, but um, making it fun, uh, I think, is really, um, as this Plato quote talks about having an emotional base, and I think that that fun element is really so crucial and it can, it doesn't have to necessarily, fun isn't the only way, you know, you can elicit emo lots of different emotions with your, with your content. Our, our stick is fun, but I really think trying to um, make that emotional connection is, is really crucial. And, and I think it's one of the harder parts to do. Um, so I, I, I don't know, that quote really stuck out to me because, um, you know, the stories I told my son and, um, um, my experiences in learning is definitely when you, when, when some emotion is evoked, um, you tend to make a much better connection to the learning content of the experience. Mm -hmm. So do you learn better in some emotions than other emotions? I mean, can you learn more when you're angry or do you learn more when you're happy or having fun? My, I don't know, but my wager is you learn less when you're angry. Um, you know, the expression when somebody's angry, well, they, well, they just saw red. <laughs> I think, right. I think that tells you a lot about how open that mind was <laughs> at that point. Right. But I don't know. I don't know. I, I think my personal, I mean, the quote I didn't put in here, which I think is really speaks to me is Ralph Nader's quote that says, uh, your greatest teacher is your last mistake. And I think that's hmm. the truth of it. You learn by making mistakes. I mean, who does anything right the first time? I mean, maybe uh, some exceptional human beings, but the vast majority of us are going to mess it up two or three times. And if you believe in evolution, then you believe that it's by messing it up that you gradually adapt and, and adaptation, I think, is learning. So, so in that case, what do we want to do is we want to, by the way, if, if people have, data or information on, you know, which emotions tend to uh, fuel learning better. I'd love to see them in the chat or if somebody could talk about it and wants to come up and talk about it. I have a feeling also that in general, we learn more when we're having fun. Um, so that then points to the fact that you really want to make your learning activities fun and you're more likely to trigger deeper learning then. Yeah, and I, I see so. from Marty, um, Negative emotions, narrow attention, positive emotions, broaden attention. Negative emotions tend to release cortisol, which causes you to focus um, and narrow your choices down. I, I, um, I think I've seen data about that. Whereas um, if you can be a, in a, an inquisitive mode or a playful mode, then you're m more open to other possibilities and, and probably willing to learn. Yeah. I and I think, you know, the evidence of that is, is abound. Like, Think of if you're walking in the woods and you see a bear, you don't think about a lot of options other than running, you know? Right, so right. I, I think there's a lot of uh, just street level evidence that there maybe might not be empirical, but I think it, tell, it tells a strong story. So another thing I wanted to point out is, uh, is I really believe in learning in small chunks, distributed practice. Uh, I, I think it's just, I don't think people learn well in long sessions. Um, you know, I think the attention span, like the, I can't remember what it's called, Maduro or something that tells you to, to take a break every 20 minutes when you're working um, to sort of reset. And I believe learning has to be the same thing. I, I really think micro learning is, is the future and it's the way to go. Um, I've, I've personally found it very hard to concentrate in school when you had uh, a one hour um, course, let alone a three hour university lecture, uh, which was almost impossible to, to stay focused for me anyway. So I think um, bite sized is really the way to go. 
breaking it into small sessions and trying to drive um, distributed practice, I really believe is, is a crucial element um, for and, in, uh, folks that are at home. And I'll also say to be able to chunk pieces of learning is another related thing. Because I see from, uh, you know, Michael Graydon, you know, cognitive overload is definitely a thing. If I have to think of five different things, then, you know, that's taking up a lot of my conscious thought. But if I can think of those five different things as related, and so they become then one thing, then that frees up my, you know, cognitive abilities to be able to look for four other things. So to being able to consolidate information so that people don't have to think of this disparate knowledge points, but can combine them into a, a larger concept, I think is, is valuable, right? Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. And I also think, um, I, I, I don't know how many folks have had this experience, but when you get overloaded with stuff, um, not just learning, but let's say you have a day where um, you find you're a little behind on your work and work seems to be piling up and whatever, um, your stress goes up and then you're less able to manage all of the different things um, that are bombarding you. Uh, and it's when you sort of release that and get a whole bunch of things off your plate that you're able to think a little more clearly uh, and your stress level goes down. And I think that's the same thing with learning is, you know, if you can focus on a small chunk and, and not clutter the brain with all sorts of other stuff. Um, I, and for me, I, I talk about um, sports and music for me are two things that I do a lot of. And the focus you can get if you're just going out and hitting a tennis ball or shooting a basketball, and that's all you're thinking about. Nothing else is in my head. And I make way more progress um, in, in things like that where I can really wipe everything out of my head except for the exercise that I'm doing. So yeah, I think I think chunking is, uh, is a really big deal. And was it the technique that you were talking about, was that the, um, you know, Marty brought it up, is that the Pomodoro technique? Or is that what you were yes. thinking? Yes, okay. that's right. And you can yeah. obviously, Google that and find out as much information about it as you wanted to. Um, there's actually a little, there's actually a little app you can download goes on your computer and it sets an alarm every 20 minutes and tells you to take five minutes to do something else. Um, we have a couple of people at the office who do that. So I think the, the last thing I, I, I wanted to, to highlight is, um, is that emotional aspect of it. And for us, why we took a game-based approach, um, I think this quote really, really says it all, um, you know, and, and speaking to like, you know, hearing someone lecture, people will forget what you said um, and showing them people will forget what you did, um, but they don't forget how you make them feel. And I think the same thing can be said about our learning experiences. Um, you know, the example I get about forgetting what you said and what you did uh, I'm sure we've all had the experience where you're driving someone home in your car and they're giving you directions. You get them home and then the next time you go to pick them up or drive them home, you have no idea how to get there. And that's because you got a guided tour. You were led and you were able to just let your brain be lazy. Um, but if you are forced to figure it out um, and, and actually pay attention, you're going to learn because that invokes um, reasoning, uh, thinking, you, you actually become engaged. Um, and it doesn't speak to the last part about how you make them feel, but I think how you make them feel is about talking to that. People learn better when, when they're sort of uh, in a happy space and, 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 and feeling positively. I, so I think this quote really sums it up for me. When you, um, when you show that you're thinking of them and you're kind of empowering them. Yeah. Well, empathy to me is the, that's a, that's a, one of the fundamental secrets of life, I think. You know, empathy is so, so important. The world needs more of it. So I would, I suspect that a lot of people came into this session, were thinking, you know, what are the technologies that you're going to show that are going to allow me to do remote learning really well? Marty, um, unfortunately, he said it to me privately, or, or, um, and, uh, but it's such a, uh, Marty, if you, you copy and paste and send it to everybody, but you, what you've been talking about is a lot of psychology, you know, self-determination theory, um, you know, allowing people to take control, um, broaden and, bu and build theory from Barbara Fredrickson, 
uh, memory research and volume with chunking, the Pomodoro technique, uh, focusing work for a, for a period of time. Um, it's not, I think a lot of what you're saying is it's not about the technology. It's about the empathy and thinking about the people you're trying to help learn. I, I agree, but I think that the technology is either designed by a team of people whose core is empathetic and will have the features and, and experience that exudes or, or, or conveys or um, encompasses all of those psychological things, or you're going to have technology that was um, not built with such an empathetic um, from such an empathetic place. And so I, I think as we try to figure out how to educate remote learners, the technology choices that we make are going to significantly impact how successful we are at actually driving those learning outcomes. So it's a combination of the emotions, but also, um, or the, you know, the um, psychology, but the technology can contribute if the technology is well designed, it will enhance our ability to use the psychological principles that we need to do in order to reach people. It's because, it, I mean, really early in the chat, there was somebody who brought up, they were looking at pre-service teachers. I'm going to try to find the, the person, but they were looking at the pre-service teachers and they really tended to gravitate towards, um, you know, relatively long videos. And the, the videos really help us as teachers teach, but they don't necessarily help the learners learn. And what we're looking for technology to do and as instructors, what we're looking to do as instructors is to help the learning, not just to make the teaching easier. Yeah, and I mean, I think, so what, here's an example. So when we run webinars for our marketing purposes, um, we'll run the webinar, but the first thing we do when the webinar is over is chunk that thing, <laughs> cut it into small bite-sized uh, pieces of content because people are busy and people don't want to typically um, listen to a one hour recording. But if you can give them a two minute little chunk uh, or less, uh, I think they're far more willing to engage with it. Well, this was kind of a longer chunk. This is almost, this is about an hour. Um, I'm hoping that what we did is we made feed people feel um, that they were valued, uh, that they were able to participate, and that they learned a lot, because I certainly learned a lot, John. Yeah, well, thank you for having me on. I, I put our, our emails up there. I hope that's okay. If I, we talked a lot about um, sort of uh, research and knowledge, and I'm um, always open to if anybody has any great research to share, because uh, I love reading about this stuff and trying to understand it. I'm not certainly not an academic. Most of what I know about it comes from personal experience and observation. So anytime I can have validation of that with uh, actual academics who've done the research, I'm always curious to, to learn. And of course, if anybody's ever interested in seeing the platform in action, you're well welcome to email me. Happy to, to show it to you. Yeah, I got a demo. It's really, it, it's, it's really cool. I think it really can be used in K-12 and in higher ed, as well as you're primarily using it in corporate. It'd be interesting to see what the people from University of Oregon end up yeah. using it for. I'm really curious about that one too, because I, I, I would love to see it get used in education because uh, I, I think we can make it more fun, so. Yeah, I hope so. Um, so yeah, feel free to get in touch with John Finley. I wanna thank um, the Serious Play Conference and Sue Bowley for making this possible. And um, if you have, if everybody, anybody has suggestions for other topics, um, uh, we're open to other topics and we'll be filling out our schedule soon. Uh, for those wanting to a demonstration of the uh, Lemonade platform, please get in touch with John. It's, it's worth it, it's really cool. And uh, John, thanks again. And everybody who showed up, thank you so much. Um, oh, and I see, I'm gonna leave this up for a second so people can, can get the NEATS uh, email information if you're interested, because um, he's willing, he was looking to do some experience with on online learning. So hopefully uh, you can copy his email. We've recorded this, so, so you'll be able to see it as, on as an archive in about two days. So John, again, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you for coming and uh, hope to see you at other events. Take care. Thanks, gang.